As Terry mentioned, I'm one of at least three uh, presentations on pharmacogenomics, and they're almost every center that put forward one of the forms that got came is doing something in pharmacogenomics. So uh, I think the, there will be some issues there in terms of uh, whether uh, the room is big enough for the breakout session, but hopefully people will go to all the breakout sessions or go to, go to other ones as well. I also think in terms of one of the things that, that uh, Rex and Terry charged us with was trying to find some, some projects that could go forward. And because of the commonality of, of pharmacogenomics, I, I think there will be one or two there that uh, will come out of uh, maybe Mark's presentation, mine, Alan's, et cetera, that, that could, be, uh, could be taken forward. I think that's it. We'll find out. You can always give someone else's. Yeah. Yeah, the, at the uh, Christmas party at University of Aberdeen, back when you used slides, they would invite four faculty to bring four slides, and then they'd mix them all in a bowl, and you had to pick out four slides and give a talk on those four slides. So it was, of course, this was, this was in Scotland, so ethanol was involved. So, uh, but they, they were either, uh, it could be awesome. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, pharmacogenomics, but mainly um, hit on some of the, uh, the endpoints that I think we need to be focusing on, because Oh, really what's represented in this room are a bunch of people who have been doing things one way and uh, a receiving endpoint. So we heard from a couple of CEOs that really look at the world a very different way. Now, St. Jude's is still pretty research intensive. But as we got from the, the presentation from Geisinger, the, the key endpoints for a, many of these hospitals um, have nothing to do with what study section recognizes. And so I'll come back to that point. I think we need to start tackling those because right now we're, we're building things for a, uh, a, an audience that's different from the actual application audience in, in many cases. So pharmacogenomics can be a lot of things to different people and also hitting on that same point, we've spent a lot of time discovering things and hunting down the rare uh, aspects and there's been relatively little time um, on the, the clinical aspects. And, uh, our institute, as Terry wanted me to put one slide in, at least on my institute, is made up of a, a, a bunch of different people trying to go across this divide. But as you, as we've already heard about, man, I'm tired of pushing that. Well, as we already heard about, there, most everyone is down here on the the uh, the discovery end uh, because that's where the funding is, and there's very few people really pushing all the way across the the, the divide um, in its in its truest sense. Now we have these examples. I trimmed down my usual list to just include germline examples. And there, there are uh, at least one FDA approved, uh, approved drug that I haven't put on here yet. But we, we do have a number of examples that, that could be used. And that group of people I showed you on the previous slide, and Federico Nocente, formerly of, of Mark's group, now at UNC, um, is, is, uh, is, is part of this effort. Th there are studies in, in all of these different areas that are going on. Prospective studies where we're doing interventions based on genetic markers uh, for that. But they're very focused, one question, one genetic test, one or a very small number of endpoint types of questions. Think, think R01, R21 types of questions. And that's fine, there, there certainly is, is a need for a lot more of those. But I think that genomic medicine, if it's to go forward a little bit faster, is gonna need to be asking broader questions. And I'll come back to that point in just a second. So one example, and this is data from Matt Getz at Dick Winschelbaum's uh, uh, place at Mayo Clinic, um, who saw differences in outcome from breast cancer with treatment from tamoxifen based on the CYP2D6 um, endpoint. And the, the poor metabolizers here, if I can get this to work, you know, need some other drug. Uh, tamoxifen works okay in these green folks, but the intermediate folks, which about 40% of women, was the part that was really neglected. And so many of us in the room got a lot of phone calls from a lot of oncologists who were ordering this test and asking the question, what do we do with the 40% of our patients? And so we did a, a very simple study. It was just published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology a couple of months ago. And we asked the question, we looked at, at active metabolite levels after tamoxifen in, in initially in a pilot study of 119 patients. And we found that the intermediate metabolizers indeed had lower blood levels uh, than the, the, the excuse me, the rest of the group. And so we did a simple thing. We, we took the extensive metabolizers and left them on the normal dose, 20 milligrams. We took the intermediate metabolizers, if I can get the arrow to move. Anyway, you can see it, the orange ones, and we doubled their dose. So we did a test in a CLIA environment, and we either left them on the same dose or doubled their dose. And what we were able to demonstrate is after that simple change, we normalized blood levels. So active metabolite levels were now no longer statistically significant different from each other. 
And yes, I don't know why that purple group went down a little bit. It wasn't significant, but it sure was irritating. Um, but the, the, um, there was no longer a statistical difference. Now, blood levels do not equal outcome. We haven't proven that we're curing women with breast cancer. But we are demonstrating that genetics in a prospective setting can lead to an intervention that can be simple and easy to conduct without needing even an algorithm. This study was done. We've now expanded to over 500 patients. And this study was completed in sites uh, across uh, 64 of the 100 North Carolina counties. So coming back to the point that Jeff made, wherever he is, that uh, we did this mainly outside the mothership, par partly because academic centers are so painful to work in, and partly because most patients are not seen at academic centers. So if you're acting, asking a practical question, the academic center may be the wrong place to ask that question in some cases. Um, and, and at least we need to be including the real world, if you want to call it that, in that. Now, ironically, these 500 patients were accrued in less than a year. We planned on enrolling 20 patients a year until we went out to the community sites. We had a very simple question, easy to conduct, anything they could do. Patients demanded this. And we enrolled 500 people in less than a year. Jeff enrolled 1,000 and whatever it was. The, there are opportunities that can be done more efficiently um, in, in, uh, in these, these types of settings. So a number of these examples that, with, that I'm showing you here, these are examples from the FDA package insert changes, are being conducted out in the community setting, sometimes with no uh, patients being enrolled from the academic center, um, as we try to understand how does this stuff really work and from a process standpoint and other aspects um, out in, in, uh, in, in uh, community practice. Places where we wouldn't want our relatives to be treated, but where many patients are treated. Um, and that there, there's a need there. The other part, as I mentioned, is there's this huge gap um, that we really ignore. We're great at step one and step two here, and, and really have not put a lot of, of time and effort into these, these latter stages. And now it's time to, to do that. And I think we need to be looking at what are the drivers for step four and step three, because they're not the same as step one and step two. And, and it's a hard thing for those of us who are used to writing uh, NIH-style grants, that study sections like certain things, they, they often do not resemble um, the endpoints that we need to drive forward. I'll come back to that point in a, in a few slides. And it's mainly because of how boring these aspects are, uh, that, that we've ignored them. And, and now we, we need to figure out a way to get excited about that. So it comes also to, to parts of the health system we really, or I really don't like interacting with. I apologize to any of you who are health economists, but you are really boring. I mean, health, you know, having to interact with these folks is really challenging. It's totally different in point. The, the language is very different. H health system integration, what works for the VA doesn't work for, for Duke and UNC, et cetera. Um, medical informatics, I mean, the impact that our iWarfarin iPhone app had on our, our prescribers was dramatic. People said that they didn't, didn't believe the data was there until they had their iPhone app, and now they're using it routinely. It's, you know, trying to get to what are the real questions. Often the real answer is not lack of data, it's lack of ability to translate. Um, and so we need to be working on things uh, like that. And I think uh, certainly Scott and, and possibly Howard will talk about uh, the research to clinical assay aspects, because certainly uh, the, he's uh, done a lot of work in that, in that area. So we, we have a new audience. In the past, the audience was ourselves, editors, reviewers, study section, um, and, and now, Often the one people we're trying to convince are clinic administrators who are more interested in clinical efficiency than they are preventing bleeding in the head and the gut. And so if we can make warfarin, the warfarin clinic see 5% more patients, they will mandate genetics. Whereas if we do a randomized trial showing that bleeding is, is decreased, they'll make us do another trial to see if we can do it twice. And so we really need to be looking at what are the real drivers. The, the payers themselves are, are certainly in an audience, and then patients are getting more involved with this. Patients are now starting to order the test themselves, starting to demand the test, um, even when it's not appropriate. Um, and, and we need to at least address that audience, even if we don't think they're right. We also have additional endpoints. And I'm, I said additional, I said new, but also meant additional, because survival, stent thrombosis, adverse events aren't going to go away. Those are important endpoints. But we need to add some things that are, are equally important in the eyes of the health system. Things like selecting amongst equal therapies. Now you might have your favorite therapy for your favorite disease, but I bet you there's some level one or at least level two evidence for other therapies that are equally as good. You know how to spell this one, so you use it. But there's something else that's almost as good or maybe even better. 
Um, and, and so how does one adjudicate between equals is a common thing done in health systems and not a common thing done at academic centers. Again, because it's boring. Um, and so getting at some of these things. Return on investment for the medical home. When uh, adverse drug reactions used to be a cash cow for medical centers. I mean, if you're having a tough year, all you need is a couple Stevens Johnson syndrome cases and you're, you're flush again. Now, with the medical home concept, you're given set amount of money and adverse drug events start losing you money. We now have incentives to try to really get, uh, tackle that um, and, and, um, and look at, at that return on investment. Quality measures, something that is, is again, in the boring category, um, but very important in terms of how health centers um, are operated. Um, and I can't remember what the other one. Oh, patient satisfaction also is part of that. Now I'm going to skip over that in the interest of, of time. But the, uh, the concept of, of intervention or preemption um, is, is something that we're very comfortable with, with breast cancer screening, uh, with colon cancer screening, Down syndrome screening, and they're all about the inflection point. Find an inflection point and offer the screening. Very simple uh, types of messages that are out there. Adverse drug reactions are, are certainly a, a major problem. Most of us here are, work in that area and are, are realize that. Um, and, and yet we haven't really approached it in that same way. And we have some initial data, and it'll be a little smoother and, and better soon, uh, working with some of the colleagues at, at Medco, trying to define where is the, the threshold for risk of needing a medication, or risk of needing a medication with a high level of adverse events, or risk of needing this medication where there is a genomic test that could offer some level of, of uh, benefit. And so this concept is, is something that we're, we're pushing on and something I think this group needs to help tackle um, if we want to move the field forward in genomic medicine rather than individual genomic studies. Now, the examples that are out there do lend themselves very well to this sort of preemptive action. And I'll, I'll have a, a, a slide that mentions Dan Roden in a second because this is really the gospel that Dan has been preaching uh, for, for quite some time. And, and that is that one can intervene. A lot of the work that he and Josh and others have done at Vanderbilt, uh, where you, you have examples of events that matter for health systems. Bleeding events, hypersensitivity reactions, stent thrombosis, delayed discharge from pain control, all, all, all are things that, that matter, and matter a lot to the health system because that's where they lose money. Um, and, and, you know, the idea that we've ignored uh, the CYP2D6 uh, codeine oxycodone issue um, is, is really quite hilarious when you look at the percentages of patients. There are, are many things that we do in the hospital when the risk is one in a thousand or less. And then here is something where it's one in ten, and, and yet we don't think it's really that real because it's only pain. And they just need to suck it up and get over it. You know, and, and so there's some issues there that we need to work through, maybe some of our own psychological issues. The other thing is it's not a rare issue. So what this is showing is uh, 61 actionable variants. Yes, you're welcome. Um, that um, uh, that, that uh, we, we put, um, feel are, are actual as part of our pg e project and some of our others. And then we ask the simple question across a large number of populations, how often does someone have an actionable variant? And what we found uh, is that everybody has something. Now, they may not ever need that drug in their lifetime. That's a separate issue. But they have the genetic variant. So if one went in with a panel, our preferred panel, you would find that everybody has at, at least seven variants that are, can be acted on. And I think the highest was uh, about 26 uh, in one of the African populations. And so everybody, whether you're from whatever continent, um, has actionable variants. And so if you look at primary care setting, which is why we did this analysis, it's not going to be something where do a test and sometime in your lifetime you may see a patient with this problem. Um, but rather the, the results are going to be coming through and, and can populate um, uh, medical records uh, for, for activity. And we'll probably hear similar numbers from, from Mark or Peter, whoever's presenting from you, you see, and, and from Alan. Then the last thing is, is coming back to the application. Um, we, we have things with, with um, untoward events uh, like, like uh, pain, pain control. We have in, sometimes pharmacogenics is being used for insurance coverage. You can't get Stuxmab covered without a KRAS test and it, with some health plans. Identifying low utility, the, the drug's not working well in certain tumor types. Dose selection, therapy selection, Prasigil versus clopidogrel. Uh, preemptive prediction, case of Stevens-Johnson syndrome. But then we also have these elements here in terms of bundling of care, patient safety, bound, avoiding bounce backs. Things that, that really we may not care about 
in terms of our individual academic career, but are dramatically important in terms of how health systems uh, are looking at things. And the more often a patient bounces back, the less money one makes. Um, and if you want to ever get an administrator excited, you, you, all you need to do is go into that area. Um, our health system is, is, has been putting um, multiple millions of dollars in, into some of our, our programs specifically because of this issue. Um, and, and so it, it really can, can um, uh, cause activity because there's so much money to be lost. Now, it's a little bit like my 12-year-old my daughter when we go to the, the store Justice. Um, she's able to save me hundreds of dollars every time we shop. And so it's, it's taking advantage of the health system uh, by uh, saving money. Uh, it's really, uh, we're losing less money, I think, is really the term I, sh I should have used. So in terms of the opportunity, I think um, conducting preemptive activities I is the case. And, and you know, there's Elvis, but there's also Roden um, in terms of, of the K. And Dan's really um, pioneered this concept of preemptive testing. I know his sideburns are shorter, but he'll work on that. Um, the the um, targeting high-risk populations, Hospitals already know who is more likely to have a delayed discharge and to bounce back, et cetera. And there's an opportunity to go in there and tackle that. Using health system endpoints. What do our administrators care about? And I know that's painful, but it, it can, can uh, lead to faster adoption. And then lastly, using panels of variance across tasks, cross-cutting questions is something that w many of us are starting to do. And I think if we work together, uh, we can do it in a way that will benefit each of our health systems, um, in each of our careers, but more importantly, uh, the, the patients that we're serving. So I'll stop at that point. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Comments, questions for Howard? Dan, you've got to have something to say. Right. Mayor? So, so. You do. <laughs> I appreciate the call out or the shout out, Howard. I, but I think, I mean, I think the, it's, it's self-evident to anyone who, who thinks about the, the, the implementation of, am I allowed to use that word? of genetic testing, I'll just echo what, you're, what, you're, what you said, that it's just too much of a pain in the rear to do genetic testing for drug response one, one genetic test at a time. And that's why it's yeah. not adopted. And, and so the only way out of that is to do it on a, platform, on a platform that does a lot of testing at the same time and then file it away. And, I, and I'd echo what you said. We, we've started to look at our, our data that we've been collecting prospectively. And what's really striking is, is that you know there are people who there's, there's two parts to this. One is everybody has at least one variant, but there are people who have more than one, who, who pop up over and over again. Yeah. Uh, so people who, for example, are poor metabolizers for clopidogrel then turn out to be at risk for symbostatin-related myopathy. Right. So I think that that's another part of this that, that we have to start right. taking into account. And, and that's the reason to do it preemptively. Right. Well, we've gotten calls, I mean, all of us get calls from those kind of people all the time, and we think they're nuts. And, and, they, and they are, but they're nuts because they're, the drugs make them nuts. Uh, and I, you know, but, Mary? Well, so could you just clarify for us, because those are interesting data on your number of actionable variants. How did, how did you go about trying to define what you considered actionable variants? So, so yeah, I, I didn't spend a lot of time on that. For, for our uh, Pharmacogenics for Every Nation initiative, which was really more of a, a public health it, so we, we work with ministries of health across the world to develop their national formulary. So we had a consensus, uh, a consensus panel on what variants are actionable at that kind of question, for that, at the public health level. Um, and so we have uh, with clinicians. Dr drug therapy only? Yeah, yeah or only drug people? therapy. Okay. So only pharmacogenic markers. Um, th there is a not 100%, but very high overlap with CPIC, et cetera. Yeah. Um, because, you know, it's the literature is the literature. Um, but the, uh, and so there's uh, clinical groups from about 40 different countries that are involved in, in coming up with consensus for that. So you didn't pay attention to like novel stop codons or something? No, these were all things that were on DMET plus chip type of, uh, you know, there was like IL 28B is not on the chip, HLAs aren't on the chip, but. Uh, a lot of it was things that are already known. So that's not even taking into account novel variants from a particular country. That's a different project. So I just wanted to um, bring up a follow-up issue with regard to the preemptive uh, genotyping idea. So I think it's a great idea, of course, in um, integrated health systems where patients are going to be seen from cradle to death and for which uh, having that genotype information somewhere in the EMR is going to be more likely to be useful. But you guys have to address the issue of the real world and <laughs> the idea that any given patient is going to ping pong from one healthcare system to the next. Where does that preemptive information live? Yeah. How does it, how is it utilized in our current system? 
So you made it sound like the idea of putting data into our own health system was solved, because that's not. Um, there are some aspects of this that are stuck in the allergy section because they're kind of like an allergy and we want a red flag, not a red flag, we want a hard stop in terms of prescribing the drug. There are other parts that we just hope are not too invisible um, because they're, they're uh, of, of where they're located in the current EMRs. And heaven forbid you do a send out, which is uploaded as a PDF and stuck in the bowels of the EMR. Of the EMR. So it, there, it's not solved even for the, the individual centers, maybe at Dan's place, but certainly not at ours. Um, uh, Yeah, the other thing I would just add to it, I mean, the, 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 the organizing principle that we're dealing with here is the patient. And, you know, we've been reluctant um, to, you know, engage the patient at a level uh, that they can really be active participants. And we heard the example of, uh, you know, hey, everybody dies of something. Yeah, had I been that patient, uh, I would have been telling him, yes, and you're going to die from a very pissed off patient right now. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> deal with it. Um, but, you know, we're not empowering patients uh, with the tools that they need. Uh, and granted, at the present time, there's probably a relatively small group of folks who would be capable of doing it. But this is the type of thing where we need to organize around the patient, at least in this country. Because if we don't put the patient in charge of that information so that they can literally bring it with them, either in some type of a um, uh, knowledge-based representation or in some type of a device that e they either carry with them or is implanted or whatever, we don't have a shot because we're not going to get to the point, I don't think, where we're going to have complete uh, data interoperability across the entire uh, United States healthcare system. And your point is, is exactly right. We're transient, we bounce, we go to different places, we want to get second opinions. And, and even within our own healthcare system, we're wasting because we duplicate the same test over and over and over again. With the germline genetic test, you don't need to do that. That's just money that we could use for other things. So it's a critically important problem. The patient has to be the center, and we have to figure out how to empower them. At the moment, the patient is the responsible for bringing uh, drug information from clinician to clinician. And they do it with a very effective device called a paper bag. And they come in and they open up the paper bag and spill all the bottles out, some of which they uh, have rep, uh, pills they're taking, some of which they just have had in that bag forever. Um, and, you know, so there, there's, it's, uh, it, it, it's very broke. Right, in the bag. <laughs> right. right. I, I, you know, I think this really highlights a really uh, important consideration that we've got to really tackle. And actually, Pearl is going to lead a discussion tomorrow that talks about the interface between research and clinical. And, you know, we come up against this all the time. And, you know, we've heard now several times today that, you know, the patients demand it or the patients say, why are you asking me to consent to this again? Just do it. And, and I think this is really a key issue. And one of the ways around this is patient portals. I think that really is going to be a driver. Okay, great. We'll have, uh, I think David will be the, the last comment. Um, and I should say the lunch is not quite ready yet. So I would propose if you guys can hang on for another 20 minutes or so that we, uh, we go ahead with, with Mark. Uh, but uh, David, please. Well, I was going to say, having grown up in a, in a very integrated healthcare system, that there is a germline genetic test that I have done every time I want to give blood. And every time I order a blood for somebody, I type and cross match them. Right. And that's a germline genetic test which my blood group hasn't changed in the last however many years, but they order it every time. Um, so I think one of the key issues with that, why do we order a blood group every time? Because blood groups don't change either. The issue is that we don't trust that anyone else is actually going to get the blood group right when it's a critical test. And so I think even in the situation of something like a DMET, even within your own hospital, I could see that test being reordered when it's something that is of high significance. Like, like metabolizing drugs. So, so I think we do have a precedent for a genetic test that we've been doing for half a century where it gets repeatedly reordered.
I'm just curious, at St. Jude, do you reorder t the same tests over and again? <laughs> Hope not. 